lot of you have had me before, uh, and, and, and if you've had me for multiple classes, you know that I run classes a certain way typically, and I'm pretty consistent. So this class is going to be a little different than, than that for a number of reasons. Uh, this is the first time I'm teaching this class. Um, many of you probably know um, that uh, Don Huffman taught this class before, and he has accepted another role within the college. So um, I was given an opportunity to take it, and I jumped at it, because I really, really think this is a great class, and I really was interested in teaching it. But it's different in a number of respects. First of all, this requires a, a, a pretty good amount of group work. All right? Uh, a big part of your grade is going to be a project that you'll start working on around the middle of February. All right? Prior to that, you'll have some group assignments, which means you know, it's important for you to come, if at all possible, because you're not just missing the material. This isn't like material that you can do on your own. It's material that deliberately is meant to be group assignments. So um, you do have to, you know, you, do, you make every effort to be here. If you absolutely can't for whatever reason, let me know. And if you're assigned to a group or something, let them know too. You can contact them via Canvas uh, and, and so on. All right. Uh, the other thing about this is this class, if you notice, if you look close at your schedule, this class, according to your schedule, you're supposed to be in two places at the same time. Right. This class shows as listed as being in 205 and 210 from 6 to 750. Well, we obviously can't be in two places at the same time. There's not a strict separation between class and lab in this class, in other words. So any given day might be mainly lecture or might go to lab and so on. So you might have group projects where there aren't lectures and you can use machines in the lab or you could go to the library or whatever. It's just a mix of things. So it's not as rigidly structured as uh, a typical class is where you have an hour uh, of, of lecture and then typically you have an hour of lab right after it. And never the twain shall meet. You know, there's much of the, the lines are blurred between those two. So it's, it's a lot different than that. So if you come here and there's no one here at 6, you know, check in BU 210 because maybe, maybe we're in there that day. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, what else? Like, for example, today, you can stay for lab if you want, but there's an assignment that's due next week, and you're also welcome to work on it uh, on your own. And I'll review that assignment with you later on. This is going to be the world's most boring video, because all it's going to be is it's going to be the white screen. We should at least draw something <laughs> so the people, people at home can see. I don't know. I'll draw a self-portrait here. I should have someone in the class. Is anyone an artist in the class? No one gave a fun fact, by the way. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> People say I don't smile, but I do smile. I just don't smile widely. All right. So this class is unlike other classes for those reasons. Uh, in addition, late homework. I'm generally flexible about late homework. I'm going to be a little tighter on late work in this class simply because of the group aspect to it. That's one thing that, that is, is uh, going to force me, I think, to keep everyone moving in the right direction. Uh, the projects you'll be working on in this class are real world projects. In other words, I have been talking to people on campus and a few people in the community about real life projects that they need. And I'm assembling a list of them and we will assign those to groups of three or four. Uh, again, around mid-February. All right? And there'll be a process that we'll go through. You'll get more information on that when the time comes. All right? And that really is, is, is probably the biggest part of this class. Many students who take this class attest to it being very difficult and very time consuming. But almost all of them, at least, <laughs> at least after the semester is over and they have a little bit of time to reflect upon it, have given me feedback. And again, I'm not even the one that taught this course in the past, but how beneficial the class was to them. All right? Because unlike assignments in other classes, it's not like you're given a well-defined problem to solve. All right? We're not going to say create a program to calculate, you know, one of my favorites that I do in some of, the, some of my different programming classes. Write a program to calculate tuition at LC, right? So write a web page that shows a tuition chart. All right, that's very well defined, all right? 
here, you're given a problem, you're given an organization with a problem, and you're asked to solve their problems, all right? Or not all their problems, but a problem that they're experiencing. You're, you're asked to figure out the requirements of what you will need to do to solve that problem. So it's a much more open-ended thing. And communication's gonna be critical, all right? Getting a little ahead of myself, but I do wanna sort of set uh, the expectations of, of what this class is. Certainly we'll talk more about this as the semester goes along. I'm gonna assume everyone is uh, uh, familiar with Canvas. We'll start out looking at, uh, um, uh, looking at the syllabus and looking at the, the way the class is structured. Uh, then we'll get into uh, sort of some of the topic material. So I'll probably have a normal length lecture today, uh, and then next week uh, we'll go from there. So. to insult you by reading my syllabus word for word. That's the one thing that I absolutely hate when people show PowerPoint presentations and they read them word for word. That, that's like my least favorite thing. I'd rather go to a dental appointment than to listen to someone read their PowerPoint slides. Actually, the worst, the worst presentation I ever saw in my life, a person read their PowerPoint presentation and I'm sitting, sitting there thinking like, oh God, what do I got to do to get out of this? And they said, uh, well, at this point I'm going to show a video. And I thought, well, things are looking up, right? They're not going to be reading their PowerPoint presentation. They're going to show a video. The video was of a different person showing and reading their PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so it was like, you know, I would have assumed it was a joke if, if, I, didn't, if I didn't actually experience it and nothing seemed like it was a joke. Uh, at any rate, uh, keep that in mind, by the way, later on in this class when you give presentations of your project to people. You know, don't read your PowerPoint. You know, talk to us. Tell us a story. Tell us about it and so on. Anyhow, the top part of the syllabus, the intent of this is to show you that there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me. All right? And there's a lot of ways for you as an individual or later on as a group to contact me and to discuss things with me. All right, a lot of different ways. You can call me on the phone, which is probably one of my least preferred methods because simply because I am, I check my email more fre frequently than I check my voicemail. All right, so it's probably better to send me an email. But you can call me on the phone if you need to. You can send email at my regular email address, my regular LC uh, email address. You can contact me um, um, via Canvas, of course, through Canvas email. I will post office hours um, sometime this weekend, so you can see me during office hours. Uh, if those office hours don't work, we can arrange other times to meet with me. All right, so I may define a certain set of office hours, but that doesn't mean that you're restricted only to those hours, right? You can come in, talk to me, and we'll arrange another time that, that, that I can be here to, to talk to it. You're welcome to come and sit in on any of my other classes' lab sessions. Um, that's true. The only trouble with that is I really only have two other classes this term. Another section of this class, which if I'm around, I could answer your questions, and a 216 class on Monday and Wednesday. No, this is Monday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Thursday, I have a 216 class. But you could do that as well. If you can't make it on campus, we can talk via the phone, we can Skype, and so on. The point I try to make in this section is just to listen. There's a whole bunch of ways, so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make it so that, like, well, gee, I can't make his office hours, so I don't have time to ask him a question, or I don't have time to discuss the situation with him. There's a lot of different ways to discuss the situation with me, so take advantage of one of them. We can figure it out, all right? We can figure out a way to get your, you or your group's needs addressed and questions answered and so on. The textbook is this book, which comes in a number of different uh, configurations over in the bookstore. So uh, I don't know what all those are, but there's like a loose leaf version of it. I think there's an ebook version of it, and I think there's that. 
So um, we will be using the book, and, and that's the way it is, 11th edition. Um, I'll use Canvas to communicate information between class sessions, so please check Canvas frequently. Um, you know, something like, for example, when I wasn't going to be there today, um, I posted the Canvas for my day class, I, I'm not going to be here. So I hope, no, I hope people saw that and didn't come into to class, otherwise I've gotten off on the wrong foot with uh, so many people in that class. And, and I apologize if you're watching this for that, but there was really no other way. Um, you know, it was something I, 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 I couldn't be here for. Um, so I'll post things like that. Um, on occasion, people ask me questions that I don't know the answer for, all right? And if that happens, um, you know, I, I will do some investigation and, and come back with an answer uh, later on. Or something that I forgot to mention that's critical. Any kind of thing like that. So check at least a couple times, you know. Check on the off day between classes, so check on a Tuesday, then check maybe once or twice over the weekend. Should be, should be good enough. There's a whole list of college policies here that are pretty much taken from the handbook, but just as a reminder, so review those and see if you have any questions about those. Incompletes, coursework, and so on. Um, your final grade will be based on, uh, on your grades in the following activities, homework, exams, and the project. And it will simply be the, the total points, your points divided by the total points. All right? So, um, you know, however many points it ends up being, you divide your points uh, uh, by that, and that will give you a percentage, and then it's 90, 80, 70, 60, and so on. Schedule a subject to change. If any changes are made, I'll announce them in class. Some of the portions may be omitted. Additional information might be included. It's your responsibility to read the material prior to coming to class. This is uh, an approximate schedule. Today we're going to have the course introduction and chapter one. I almost slipped into reading my presentation to you. You're allowed to boo me if I do that. How about that? It's a contract that I'll make. If you start, if I, if I hear people booing, I know that I'm reading something off the screen. So that's the deal. Um, I may try to cover things a little quicker than the schedule simply to give you more group time near the end of the semester. All right? So if anything, read a little bit ahead and, and you should be okay. All right? Any questions about this? What kind of projects are what kind of projects are, uh, are, are there? Um, I, I can talk about some projects that were done in the past. I'll try to, I'll try to remember some of them. Um, I wish I ever brought those papers with me. I don't think I did. Uh, one of them was a system to handle locker rentals here on campus. All right, you know you can rent a locker. Did you know you can rent a locker? Well, yeah, I would say if you don't, you know that now, right? Well, they keep track of who rents them, you know, and, and then they, you know, they, they, you know, that you've paid them and, and so on and so forth. So there was a system to track that. Um, let's see. Uh, another project that they have worked on uh, in this class. Um, think. This is tough because I haven't, like I said, I haven't taught the class before. Let me run back to my office. I'll grab you last year's list of projects. All right, so talk among yourselves for five minutes.
system down into two pieces. Uh, likewise, AS400 data dashboard. The AS400 was a, a, an old system that we had here. There was a way to pull data out of that and they created a little application to do that. Uh, be like student data, that sort of thing. And a data center, so that was a different uh, aspect of that. But uh, those two were for, um, those were actually, okay, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute because it's, it's coming clear here. There was one to push Apple Mac images. In other words, certain people on campus have, uh, they have, uh, certain labs have Macs installed on them. Well, if you notice on the machines in uh, the BU labs, which are Windows machines, every morning when you come in, every time it reboots, in fact, it starts with a fresh image. I think they want to do something like that with the Macs as well, because they did it on the PCs and push web browser settings. I would think that was the same thing. By push it means so that when it's initially started, you get the new settings. You don't have to do anything specific to download it. That's typically what it means when, I, when you talk about pushing something. Uh, no, you don't have to ask for it, you get it sort of automatically. Um, these are, are, are sort of broke down to uh, by, by discipline. Um, the locker rental system and the AS400 data dashboard were software development projects. As you know, we, we have potentially majors from our four programs in this room. Our four programs are what? Software, Software networking, development, web development, networking, web development, and number four? Security. No. This is business CISS areas. No one knows it. All right. That's why I want to try to build one. Is mobile software development. That's the fourth one. So we potentially could have students for all four of these things. So I think what they did with these projects is they broke them down into a networking component, and that was one project, and the, the, the uh, software development component was another pro uh, one. So in other words, the networking people for the locker rental did the networking needed to implement this uh, locker rental system, and likewise with the AS400, they did the network, uh, networking for that. And again, the software development people did software development for that. Uh, other projects I am aware of in the past, someone took and made a little arcade with a Raspberry Pi, uh, if I remember right. They did that uh, one year, a student was showing me that. I usually only know about this second hand or if like students ask me. Do any of you have friends that took this in previous years? Can anyone recall that? All right. Here's the idea about the project, though, and this is what makes this I could supply a number of adjectives here. I'm going to say fun. I'm going to say a valuable educational experience. I'm going to say stimulating. You might, by the end of the semester, say frustrating, enraging, annoying. Is that two things? These projects 
are not something where we spoon feed a problem and you have to solve it. You have to discover the problem before you solve it. So one of the projects that I'm talking about is working on a system for the daycare here on campus, all right, uh, to, to track and to help them do their scheduling and so on and so forth. I don't want to talk too much about it um, now, but that's one of the things. I talked with them for, I don't know, a half hour, 45 minutes. I got a sense of the project. I think it probably will be a good project for this class. But I couldn't write down specifications. That's your job, if you're assigned to that group, that is. Your job will be to talk to the people from the daycare center, to figure out what it is that they need, to document it, and then to build and test and implement that software for them. Now, the other aspect of this that <laughs> we could choose from my set of adjectives or your sets of adjectives is that you may end up working on technologies that you haven't used before. All right? This class is not a technical class. I'm not going to teach anyone programming in this class, all right? I've programmed for a million years, so I can answer many of your programming questions, but I'm not going to sit up here and lecture about loops and if statements and SQL statements. I'll be there to advise you if you have questions and so on. Likewise, I'm definitely not teaching any networking stuff in this class, right? My, uh, my networking knowledge is like, is it plugged in? Did you try rebooting it? Are all the cables connected? Got me then, I don't know if the answer to those questions are, are yes, all right? But the point is, is that you'll be presenting these problems, some of the stuff you might have done before, some of the stuff you might not have. And that is real, real realistic in a job situation, all right? Where you come in, you get a job because you've, you've shown in your background that you can do this sort of work, all right? Uh, but there's a piece of a project that you're assigned to that you've never done before. And if you think about that, as far as your career goes, that's actually a good thing to be able to take that. That way you can leverage skill in one area and then pick up new skills um, and, and, and become good uh, uh, proficient on them. There was a project that I was working on that I was assigned because I had done um, old school ASP programming. I did that for, for a while. And, but I never worked on an Oracle database. Well, guess what? That was my new technology for that project. So I could say that I have worked in an Oracle database system. So I took something that I knew and leveraged that to be assigned to a project where I could pick up new skills. Now, it's not like we're shoving out you, uh, you out here alone. You know, you can talk to other faculty members, you can talk to other students, you can talk to me. But part of the job will be discovering the problem and maybe learning stuff that you haven't learned before, all right? And again, that's really, in my opinion, the one thing that makes this class special and really makes it a, a very valuable learning experience, all kidding aside, all right? So that kind of answers the questions. Uh, the projects I'm looking at now, the daycare is one. Uh, a second one is like a stock ticker for the business division. All right, have you ever seen like uh, some places they have like a ticker showing the stock? I really wish we could get one of the old ticker tape machines like they had in the Adams Family. I don't know if you ever watched the old Adams Family where it came out on punch tape. That would really be excellent, but I don't think anyone sells those anymore, so it'll be a display. Uh, another possibility is with the gardens that are here on campus, all right, to have a guide uh, to the gardens that would be something that would be using geolocation. So in other words, if you are closest to this garden, it will tell you you are closest to the healing garden, for example. And here's the kind of plants that are there. And it'll show you a list of plants with pictures and so on. That's one that we could develop first as a web page that was uh, location aware. And then we could even, depending on how it goes, even do a mobile app for that. I haven't done mobile app before. Well, guess what? Maybe you'll learn. All right? Again, depends how it goes. Um, there are some, some well, well, we'll get to that when the time comes, all right? So that's sort of the nature of this class. It, it, it will be different than other classes. It will be fun. You will, you will grow close to your team members and the other members of the class simply by virtue of working with them and depending on each other and so on. I'll have more about the project in subsequent weeks, all right? I just sort of want to lay everything out uh, today. Um, Every week, 
is going to have a module in Canvas. That's one thing that is consistent for all my classes. And if there's any sort of handouts or anything, it will be in that week. Um, the video for this class, for example, will be in the week one, just in case you were so enthralled by this class tonight that you can't wait to see it again, you can go and you can watch it again. All right? I know many of you will do that. That's okay. You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to raise your hand and say that, that you plan on doing that. I know many of you will. Uh, right now there's a homework assignment, and we might as well look at that now. It's in your book, under Chapter 1, there's a list of projects, and one of them is Project 3. And Project 3 uh, talks about... Um, Comparing and contrasting a couple different methodologies for system development. All right, so it wants you to find some web pages and, uh, and, and write up a memo. Here's the assumption. We're going to pretend like you're a consultant that was brought in to do some development work for Zellers, Inc. All right, and I'm the CEO. So I'm going to say, you know, I read an article about different system development methodologies and I just didn't get it. Can you go and can you write up something that I can understand about the different software development or different development methodologies? This applies whether you're talking about software or networking or web or whatever, but we'll just say system development methodologies. And it's discussed in chapter one. We'll discuss it more a little bit today and, and definitely some next week on, on, uh, on Monday. Um, but you're to find some information about it and compare it in contrast and write up a memo the way that so that an intelligent but non-technical person would understand it. You know, assume that the CEO has something going for them, right? This isn't dad's company that they just inherited the position, right? They, they did something right, all right? So they're knowledgeable about something, but they're not necessarily a technical person. So write it with that perspective, all right? Um, and, and provide your sources, provide what sites, and make it look professional. So, you know, use... Use a, a, you know, use Word and create, use a Word template and, you know, just have at it. Make it look professional. Uh, part of this class, again, is reinforcing, you know, professional behavior, professional communications, and so on. So as such, you know, where I say write a memo, it should be something that you would expect to see in a, in a business. So, you know, full sentences, um, check your spelling, uh, and so on. The one excuse I hear people say is, well, I'm not a very good speller. Well, all the more reason to pay attention to spell check then, right? And look at it and see what it says. So make it as professional as possible because those things do have an impression on people, all right? And we want to uh, be as professional as possible in that. All right. Um, Let's see. Can I have by a show of hands? I probably will ask you to fill out a form at some point. How many networking majors are there in this class? Okay, now I'm going to walk out. There. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. How many software development majors? All right. How many web development majors? How many mobile development majors? How many would you would like to major? <laughs> Okay, all right, cool. Well, that, that's probably about what I expected. All right. Um, let's see what else. All right. Start out. What's the title of this course? Oh, I'm gonna have to erase this. I'm gonna take a picture of it. Oh well. You have a picture of it. Pardon me? You have a picture of it. I do? It's in the video. There you go. <laughs> Screen cap, thank you. I actually did that. I dressed for Halloween last year as Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I was thinking, like, I asked him, like, did anyone take a picture of that? And no one did, and I was like, I did the same thing. I got a screen cap of it. So, thank you. <laughs> All right. The name of this class is System Development. What do you think about when you...
when you hear the word system? Yes. Organization. Organization. Okay. What else? A relationship between two things. Okay, relationship between two things. Okay. Anything else? Group of things that works together. Group of things that work together. Anyone else? The order how things works. The order? Okay. All these are good, good expressions. I think I'm going to talk about a couple of aspects of this. First of all, would you think of a hammer as being a system? Maybe. Maybe. There's a, a, a piece of metal attached to a piece of wood. I guess you could. Series of nails. Okay. That could be a nail installing slash, if it was a claw hammer, could be a nail installing, deinstalling system. I guess you could. All right. Think about tire as a system? I would probably say no to the hammer, but we're not going to argue it. This isn't Jeopardy. Right. Part of system. Pardon me? I think when we talk about systems, all right, we're talking about a set of components. All right. And all these things kind of talk about that. This talk about a relationship between two things. Actually, in a system, you've got a relationship between a bunch of things, not just two. All right. Maybe at least two, all right, would be a good way to say it. A group of things that work together. An order of things, uh, of things how it work. That sort of implies that this isn't a simplistic one-step boom thing, but there is a process that goes through. All right? And organization sort of suggests the same thing. You don't need to organize if they're, well, I say you don't need to create an organizational chart for, for a one-person company, right? You don't need to organize when there's only one person, all right? And therefore, the implication sort of with all these is you're talking about a set of things. And I think in this definition, uh, I'm going to call the things that make up a system the components. Terminology is important, by the way. Uh, I'm not a stickler on terminology, but I think it is important that we try to use this common set of language so that we understand. So I would say a system, if I had to define it, all right, for example, if I had a, um, a class, and that class had a midterm, all right, like around week eight, and the instructor, very old and wise instructor, were to ask the question, what is the system? Here might be the answer that would get 100% full credit for that question. Set of components that work together to serve some purpose. So, you know, when you talk about an automobile, really, an automobile really has systems and subsystems, really, if you think about it, because the transmission itself is a system. The steering itself is a system. So you could talk about an automobile and its components, but its components themselves are systems. So it's really sort of a complicated system. But in any case, you know, a set of components that work together to serve some purpose, I would say is a definition, a good definition of component. Now, there's been systems all, of, all the time. There's been systems throughout history, right? Uh, people, um, you know, even before computers, right? People generate, you know, the, the, the generation of electricity through, um, you know, through water that goes, I don't know, how do you generate electricity? Sometimes there's like waters going over things and it turns things, turbines and stuff like that, or windmills, or you burn coal, or you do whatever, right? Those are all systems, right? Because they fit our definition. 
There were a set of things that worked together to serve some purpose. All right? You know, horse and buggy is a system, right? You don't have to talk about automobiles. There's a horse and there's a buggy. So right there you got two components, right? And they work together to serve some purpose. All right? So systems are nothing new. But since computers came on the scene, people have really focused on this sort of mindset, all right? So our focus is going to be on systems where one of the components is going to be computer or computer sort of related uh, equipment. What would you say some of the other components of a typical computer system are? Talking about a, a computer system for an organization. We might talk about our payroll system, for example. Friday's payday, so I'm excited. All right? So what are some of the components in LC's payroll system? Yes. Database. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, the thing database that has everyone's names and how much okay. like they're supposed to be paid. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna say data. That's obviously a critical part, right? You know? To know who gets a check and how much the check is for and what the deductions are and so on and so forth. So data is what? Yes. Uh, network to distribute that information. Network to distribute that? All right, true. Okay, I'm going to write some of these things down. We're actually going to summarize some of these things. Um, <coughs> networking and security. They're definitely components. Software. Software. Um, Pardon me? The money itself? The money itself? Uh, I suppose you could say that more so than that would be maybe the physical checks uh, and or the direct deposit data that gets transmitted to, to banks would be that. And I would say those are just ex those are examples of data. All right? Because our payroll system doesn't like produce you know gold bullion or print money for us or anything like that. All right, but yeah, the, 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 the representation of that money, either in the form of a check or a direct deposit, absolutely would be a component. But we'll lump that under data. Well, other thing we forgot is what makes this, and again, there are payroll systems before they're computers, right? All right. But what distinguishes com uh, uh, systems nowadays is that there's going to be a computer involved. All right. A couple other key things. These are the ones that I would expect you, I would not expect you to get. Yes. The people. The people involved. Absolutely. Very few systems work on their own. And even the ones that work on their own, there's probably people watching them to make sure that they're working on their own. All right? So people would be another one. And what would, there's one more that really this is a long shot, unless you've cheated and read ahead in the book. I'm just kidding, that's not really cheating. Yes? The institution itself? The institution itself? Um... You could say that. I think that would work into the, the, the people and the data and all that, the, the sort of the, the, the culture and all that. I wouldn't necessarily call that a component of the system. The other big component is what I would describe as procedures or processes. Usually, when these systems are, when these are defined, usually you'd work security... actually is an aspect of all of these things. So it's really not its own component, right? There's security relating to the people. Like, not anyone can get in the payroll department. It's physically locked by a key, all right? Um, 
there's security with the database. There are certain passwords that you need to get into the database and so on. So security really is a component of, of all of these things. And networking, I would kind of put uh, under uh, a mix of computer equipment and software. So really, typically, these are the five components that you're talking about. Data, hardware. So that's computers, but it's also routers and other stuff. Uh, software. And this would be things like the application software itself, but also the system software, like the operating system, and so on. People and procedures. Let's talk about a payroll example, and let's talk about all the components. We sort of talked about data, right? Do you think the data that they keep about the payroll data that they keep about employees here at LC now is much different than the payroll data they kept in 1970, or whenever the college was founded? When was the college founded? 19... 64, 63, something like that. Probably not, right? Let's look back then. Let's look back in the time. Were there employees? Yes. Did they get paid a certain amount? Yes. Did they have deductions for their tax? Yes. Did they have an address? Yes. All right? So from a purely looking at a data level, data actually doesn't change a lot over time. All right? What does change a lot over time? The, the handling of data or the way data gets used, all right? In the old days, everyone probably got a paycheck. Didn't matter who you were. Now, some people get a paycheck, but I think just about everyone gets a direct deposit. Doesn't change the data, but changes how that data is being used. I can go online and with proper credentials, I can log in and see what my paycheck was or what it's going to be on Friday, all right? So I, can, <laughs> so I can see if I can afford to go a movie, you know, within the next two weeks or something like that, all right? Uh, or I can see what my past paychecks were, see how much the deduction was for insurance and all that. That's something I couldn't do years ago, but that data was still there, all right? It was locked in a filing cabinet where only certain people could get to it, but that data was still there. So it's a fundamental rule of data that... The use of data changes more than the actual data itself. The data itself um, is really a function of the problem that you're talking about and less to do with the times. The database, from a software perspective, when I say software, I'm including web stuff because most web stuff is simply software that lives on the web, likewise with mobile. The data and the database sort of forms the foundation of the application. If that's solid, the application can be solid. And it can be maintained and it can be changed, etc. If that's not solid, then you're going to have problems. And the fact that data doesn't change much is a good thing. There might be new data, all right? For example, there are health spending accounts now. I don't know if any of you know what those are. I barely know what they are, but I know that they're a thing because they ask me if I want one, all right, every year, all right? So there, there's such a thing called, for tax purposes, health spending accounts, all right? Now, that's more data than it used to be there, but the fundamental data still hasn't changed. There's stuff added to it, but it hasn't drastically changed. So data, remember that about data. S software and, and, and web and mobile people, when you're defining a database, get that part right, because that will serve to be the foundation of everything else. Hardware, you know, that's what defines a computer system as opposed to some other kind of system, right? Um, and again, whether the hardware be here or located with a payroll service or something like that, obviously there's some computer that does the processing that creates it. Likewise, software, we all pretty much know what that is. There's going to be an application to, that handles the payroll, does all the things that a payroll department needs. And 
Um, there's going to be system software that sort of makes sure the software, uh, you know, makes sure that everything works and talks together. Um, remember, an application software um, might take the same data and do a bunch of things with it. All right. For example, a payroll program, obviously a payroll application, obviously one of its big purposes is to, to, to print checks, right? But a payroll application might also give spending uh, on payroll by department. So you can see what department, um, you know, what their spending is if you're doing budgeting and things like that. So you can take that data and show it many different ways and through the software you can do that. If the data is stored in a flexible enough manner and in a good enough manner, then that's an easy thing. People. Obviously people are the things that make everything work. All right, they're the people that are actually going to enter the data in, they're going to run the programs, they're going to do what they need to do. Procedures is the one that I want to talk about. What might be an example of a procedure? Well, first of all, what do I mean by procedures? Any, any thoughts on that? Any guesses? The steps taken to execute the information. All right, steps taken to, to execute the information. And who takes those steps typically? People, right. Procedures are more or less uh, instructions for people to perform their job. All right. What might be a procedure within a payroll system? How you track your time. How you track your time, right. How you track your time and communicate your time to, uh, to um, the payroll department. That would be a good example of a procedure. Yes? Steps someone might have to take to get access to it, so that they need to enter or change information? Yes, what needs to be done if you need to change information? For example, if I change the number of dependents, all right? That would be another example of one. What do you do if a new person is hired? What are the procedures that you go through to make sure that, that that's there? It's important that these procedures exist and that they're, that they're um, followed and that they're documented, all right? You certainly don't want just anyone having the ability to go ahead and change stuff. There has to be procedures, you know. I can't go in and change anything that relates to the payroll. I would have to put a request into the payroll to say, hey, I now have one more or one less deduction. Go and change it, and then they would go and change it. But it would be uh, definitely clearly defined what I would need to do to do that. All the employees that fill out hourly time cards, for example, that's something that they would need to do. And the procedure might be that you will give me, you know, this sheet of paper every Friday or every two Fridays give me this sheet of paper or whatever. And they need to know what exactly they need to do in order to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So there's, those things are defined as procedures. And again, the key thing for them is they're important because they can document how people are going to do their job. You know, could you imagine if there wasn't a procedure for entering a new person, all right? Um, what could happen? Well, someone could be working here for months without getting a paycheck, all right? Possibly. I probably would have left after the first couple of weeks if I didn't get a paycheck, but theoretically. A um, person could be entered twice, accidentally. All kinds of problems could occur. The software is working, could be working fine. The hardware could be working fine. The data could be doing everything it needs to do, but if the people don't follow the proper procedures that this is what happens when a new employee gets hired, then the system ultimately isn't going to do its job. Yes? For example, there was a case in the news not too long ago where someone was, who had passed away, his family was continuing to, to collect checks because so someone had lost paperwork that classified he was dead. Wow. So somewhere right. the procedure was... Yeah, possibly, yeah, possibly a procedure wasn't followed correct, uh, or, uh, correctly. There is just plain old human error as well. Um, the, the important thing with that is there needs to be procedures what to do if you cor to correct the problem, all right, for example. Uh, for example, if, so if someone keep put in their, their time wrong and they got, ended up getting a check, you know, if the data didn't look right, you said, I worked 23 hours on Tuesday. You know, there should be a procedure to say, hey, wait a minute, you probably didn't work 23 hours on Tuesday. What did you really work? Oh, I meant I worked 2.3 or whatever. 
all right? But there should be procedures to check that and validity. And if an error is introduced into the system, there should be procedures that take care of it. And how do you correct something that, that's, that's a problem? That's especially important with financial things because, you know, if a check is written uh, or whatever, you know, that money is already out there. There needs to be something. You can't simply, like, erase it and start over. You have to make a correction one way or another uh, to it. All right? Next thing I would like to talk about, I just want to introduce this to you. I'll, I'll just go maybe five, ten more minutes. All right? Um, is the second part of the title of this class is system development. So we've identified what a system is. We talk about the system, a computer system consisting of this. So system development is going to be, guess what? Someone or some group of people developing this stuff. All right? These components. All right? Now, some of them are fixed, depending on the organization and the particular problem. You know, the, the people are probably already working for the company. All right? You're not going to go out and, and rustle up a, a group of payroll clerks. All right? They're probably already working for the company. The hardware may or may not be a fix you know, a fixed quantity. We may say, hey, we have this machine and whatever, or these machines, and that's what we're going to deal with. Our system needs to work with those, all right, and so on. But still, all these things will be taken into consideration. I'm going to put up on the board uh, a couple of things, and then it will definitely get into this heavy next week, as well as your homework assignment sort of uh, partly is involved in uh, examining these these things. I'm going to put up on here, on the board, five aspects of system development. Now, we'll spend a lot of time on Monday of next week, talking about the sequence of these. Right now, don't think of this as being a step-by-step -step, step process. We'll talk about sort of the process of system development, but I want to sort of identify right now five phases uh, of, of the system development process. And we'll talk about how these work and how these interact with each other next week. There's a phase for analysis. There's a phase for design. There is a phase for build. There's a phase for test. And there's a t phase for implementation. In some methodologies, you start with one, do this, do this, do this, do this. In other methodologies, you sort of have a cycle of these. You do a little bit of this, 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 then go back and start over again and repeat it. So you have a sort of cycles. Or you have just one cycle with these being a big step. That doesn't matter today. We'll talk about that more on Monday. But I do want to define what these things entail. Analysis, in a nutshell, is identifying the problem. That's a task, all right? That's a chore. That's harder than it sounds, all right? If the CEO came up to you and said, we need a new website, have they identified the problem? No, all right? Why do they need a new website? Does the CEO just don't like the colors of it? Does the CEO want to increase sales? Does the CEO want to delve into a market that they currently don't access? So on and so forth, right? So truly identifying the problem that needs to be solved is the, the job of the analysis phase, all right? 
Again, this is the one thing that's much different about the projects you're going to do. The project you're going to do in this class is I'm not going to say do this and define very clearly what you need to create a program to do or a network to do. I'm going to give you some people to talk to. You will talk to them and you will determine what their problem is and what it is they need to do. All right. I'm going to use a couple terms now. All right. Developers. These are the people that are, that are sort of actually creating the system, actually developing the system. Now, they don't create those in a vacuum. They spend a lot of time talking to clients. Now, a client could be a case of you're, you're doing a consulting job and it's someone that hires you to, to develop a system. But a client could be an internal client. For example, if I was working with the payroll department here on a project, uh, we're all part of the same organization, but they're the client in this case. They're the person that is essentially requesting the system. So in the case of this class, whatever group does the daycare one, they're going to be the developers. The daycare is going to be uh, the actual daycare department and the supervisors over there are going to be uh, the people that uh, are going to be your clients. All right, You talk to them and figure out what it is that they need. Finally, you have the users, which are people using the system. Are the clients and the users the same? Not necessarily. I may work with an organization's marketing department to develop a new website for them. Guess what? They're not the only people who are going to be accessing that website. The people, the general public, will be the users in that case. Over in the daycare, we're going to, the client is going to be the head of the daycare and one of their key people. They may be the only two people that use the system, or there might be two or three other people that use the system. All right. I want to distinguish be between these two to make sure we're using the same terminology. So client is a person you're making the system for who has a problem. Users are the people that are actually using the system. You're the developers. Did you have a question? OK. Good. I, I wasn't sure if you were pointing. So the clients are the, the ones that are actually asking you to develop Are actually asking you to develop it. Right. Right. Um, Here's one thing that I feel really strongly about. If you want to annoy me, this is the way to do it. All right? Software and hardware, you know, all technical people sometimes, consciously or unconsciously, look down a little bit at non-technical people. And they'll say, those users or those clients, they don't know what they need and all that. Guess what? It's not their job to know what they need in terms of hardware or software. That's your job to help them out. They know their job, right? The person that runs daycare knows about running the daycare up, down, and sideways. There's laws about running a daycare. You have to have a certain number of people for a certain number of kids, depending on the age of the kids, right? They know everything about their part of the business, all right? So they're very knowledgeable about their part of their business. They're just not technical. So don't think that, and, and never express any sort of disdain for your clients or your users simply because you have technical knowledge that they don't. That's why you're there, all right, to help them work through the problems that they understand but can't solve themselves, all right? So avoid doing that. They're on your team as well. Analysis is identifying the problem. Design is figuring out what you will do to solve the problem. Build is actually making the stuff.
to solve their problem. I come from a software perspective, so most of my thinking and analogies is going to be like writing a program, but it could also be designing, you know, making a network, uh, uh, designing a network or whatever. All right? But you'd actually make the stuff, you know. If a company wanted to enter, uh, implement wireless networking within their organization, well, then you'd actually build the wireless network in their organization, right? Testing is seeing if it works. And here's an interesting thought. Seeing if it works goes more than making sure there's no, making sure like the math works out and the program does what the programmer expected it to do. Testing it really relates to does it work to solve the problem that they've identified. All right? It's an important distinction to make when you're testing it. All right? And implementation is when you put it into real life, where they actually use the system that you've created. Associated with implementation then is maintenance, where you go back and either fix or alter stuff that slipped through the cracks or things changed or whatever. Now again, we'll talk about different ways that these are organized in the de system development process, but it's important to understand these phases first. Next week we'll talk about specific methodologies. Are there any questions over anything that we went over today? All right, that's all I had for today. Uh, you're welcome to go to lab if you want. Um, I, if anyone goes, I'll go. Uh, if any, is anyone planning on going, or is everyone going to take it off? You're going. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll go walk over to BU two ten with you, and uh, everyone else will see you next week. Yeah. Typically, how many people are you expected to be in one group? Oh, for for this class, three or four. Four. Pardon me. Uh, the groups are assigned. Yeah. Uh, I, um, well, right. Right. Uh, I understand that. Um, what will happen is I will ask people their first, second, third choice for groups, and to the best of my ability, I'll match people with as many of their higher choices as possible. But I can't guarantee that. You know, I can't guarantee. Part of the challenge, in a way, is 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 working with learning to work with different kinds of people and all that. Yes? I'm actually in the class. Is that possible or no? I guess. I'll tell you what. Send me an email and include your student number, and I will copy Carrie on it, our, our division administrator, and they will... Um, that will yeah, do whatever. I wasn't sure how this class was going to work with groups, so I kind of just signed up automatically for the, the Right, class. right, right. And then, yeah. But it would work better if I took it in email. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Yeah, just say, yeah, send me an email so I can I can go in and do that. Yes. Yeah, we, sorry, um, I just had a one. So it's the only thing right now that we have is uh, one starting to read Chapter 1 and that homework assignment you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Goodness for the top. Unfortunately, my book hasn't come in yet.